Well, we're lucky tonight to have two proper heavyweights to help us navigate our way through the current situation and look at a few of the potential outcomes. I'm joined from Hong Kong by senior investment banker, global economist and founding partner of Themes Investment Management, Ken Curtis. And here in the studio with me in Sydney is Bob Barr, chief global economist at Principal Global Investors. Well, Ken, if I can come to you in Hong Kong first, you've got to help me here. What has been achieved in this latest summit? Because I look at other treaties like the Maastricht Treaty and, and indeed the Growth and Stability Pact. These have all been breached willy-nilly. I mean, Greece, Greece is a case in point. Well, what did they really achieve? I think they achieved two things, uh, Tiki. First of all, they agreed uh, on this permanent uh, bailout mechanism. Uh, they haven't agreed on how big it should be, but at least they've agreed on it. And if we went back a year ago, of course, the Germans were dead, sent against something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, the IMF is saying they have to put a, a minimum of a trillion euros into this. Uh, the Europeans, or the Germans in particular, are talking about half that amount. Uh, but it, that's a tiny step ahead and not an insignificant one. And secondly, they've agreed on some form of discipline that the EU would impose on countries that don't respect, quote unquote, the golden rule. Um, no one knows how they would yet impose that discipline, what the sanctions would be, who would be responsible for imposing those sanctions. But again, uh, Tiki, if you stand back from this, and I know this is terribly messy and complicated, in effect, what Europe's trying to do is to go beyond the traditional nation state. And it's going to take a long time, and we're going to have ups and downs, and they may not make it. Yeah. Uh, but this weekend is one of many heads of state meetings. You realize they've had one every six weeks for the last 18 months. Do, do you think and we've made some progress, but we're still a lot more to go. Do you think, Ken, that they will make it? Because looking at youth unemployment, 22% across Europe, uh, pretty much 50% in Greece and Spain now. Uh, Tiki, I think you have your finger on exactly the, the, the key point, and that is how long are they going to be able to manage these social pressures? Uh, you can already see in some countries that take France, which has elections coming up in two months, the extreme right now is running at 20, 21 percent in the polls, and they could well end up being in the runoff for the final two candidates for the presidency of France. Uh, the left has collapsed in Europe, so we don't know where this is going politically, but we do know when you have uh, 50 percent of people under 25 who've never had the job and have very little prospect of having one anytime soon, all kinds of things can blow up politically. We've got a situation now where Portugal is being talked of as a centre point for, for a contagion. Uh, yields on Portuguese 10-year bonds hitting over 17 percent on Monday. And we've still got this deal to be done with private investors in Greece. Well, with interest rates at these levels, Portugal will not be able to make it. That is... <laughs> There's no discussion about that. Whatever one may say about they have a lower debt level than Greece, they have a better budget position than Greece, although it's not very good, uh, the reality is that Portugal has a huge external debt. Uh, they haven't made a trade surplus once in the last 50 years. I think the last time was 1962. And with these rates, they are number two on the list for a bailout. Coming to the Greek bailout, I expect it to... Uh, or the haircut, as we're calling it, uh, to come to a conclusion in the next few days. Uh, notionally, I think uh, they're going to say the haircut's 50 percent, but in reality it's going to be more like 70, 75 percent. And that still will not be enough to allow Greece by 2020 to get to a debt to 120 percent of GDP. So mm. there's still a lot more work to do on, on, on Greece. You know, there's a proverb of the Dakota, Dakota Indian tribe. It says, when you're riding a dead horse, the best strategy is to dismount, and I think we'll get to that point with regard to Greece. Do you agree with that, Bob? <laughs> well, I think what it does show us is there's a tremendous amount of risk, political risk, around the world, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, I do think, though, it's in everybody's interest, everybody's interest, uh, both the creditors and the uh, uh, citizens of Greece, the officials, uh, the countrymen. I think it's in everybody's interest that, it, that Europe at least muddles through, and I think that's the most likely scenario. Mm. Uh, looking at the the IMF's report moving uh, from Europe now to Asia, which obviously is very dependent upon Europe at the moment, the IMF sees Asia as pretty robust. Would you agree with them? Well, China has slowed and the rest of Asia has slowed somewhat, uh, kind of in sympathy also uh, from the financial crisis uh, uh, that's going on in Europe. The problem with uh, emerging markets in Asia is that they get a lot of their credit from European banks. And if they had to have a, a ended with a large credit crunch, something like what happened after Lehman or even approaching 
reducing that, then uh, credit would shut down somewhat to emerging market <clears throat> countries, and that would stop lending and slow growth a little bit more. So th there is some risk there and some contagion, probably more to emerging markets maybe even than the U.S. Ken Curtis, do you, do you see, I mean, you're in the, up in Hong Kong there, do you see China's growth slowing further this year? Uh, well, China, China, I think, will do everything from here uh, to stop it going much further. I see China bottoming over the end of the second quarter through the summer uh, this year and then coming up quite quite nicely next year. The point that Bob makes is a very important one and that is not lost on Beijing and as a result recently Beijing has been signing left right and center swap agreements to provide money uh, to finance trade between China and and countries of Asia and I think uh, that is going to partly offset the credit squeeze on European banks but All right. Asia I think yeah, I'm sorry, Asia will provide, I think, a, a good 80 percent of world growth this year. So what goes on in this region is critical to everyone. Now, uh, meanwhile, Bob Bauer, uh, you have some very uh, bullish views on America as a, a, at least a, a short to medium term place to go from an investment point of view. Well, frankly, we think the U.S. economy is now self-sustaining. The expansion is doing the things that it needs to have happen. We think job growth is improving and the pace by the end of the year we think will uh, be much better than it is now. In terms of jobs, I think business has stretched the productivity as far as they can and more more sales then will mean more jobs. Uh, state government spending has been shrinking. I think that will end by mid-year. Uh, housing, the housing industry we think is bottoming. Profit growth has been spectacular. You know, to have a double dip, you really need some excesses, and we just don't see the excesses. So we look at the fundamentals in the U.S. of the economy as as better than the uh, consensus would believe. And do you think uh, the, the government will be able to crack unemployment? Uh, I think it's coming down. It's already come down from what 103 to eight and a half and I believe it will continue to come down we expect the pace of job growth to pick up probably at the middle of the year private sector job growth in every month of the last six months was 155,000 not quite enough but enough to start bringing it down meanwhile the same IMF report is talking about Australia as being in a bit of a, a purple patch with lots of room to move uh, fiscally itself do you think uh, do you agree with that that where we can depend on this continuing boom in in China and we should doggedly go for that surplus next year? <laughs> well, I don't know about the surplus, but you know, Australia is a country that has very little debt and not too much of a deficit, and I think you're in a tremendous uh, position for a country from finance, from the financial picture anyway. Let me throw one other issue in but, but before we close, Bob, and that is the issue of, of oil, and particularly how the current standoff between Europe and Iran on oil is, is going to play out. Well, that's certainly, Iran supplies a sizable amount of oil uh, every day to the rest of the world. Mm. Uh, I think if, if there was an embargo and Iran couldn't supply it, I do think uh, Saudi Arabia is not a particular friend of Iran. I think they would try to make up as much of the, uh, as much of the shortfall as they could. Mm. Uh, and I think I don't believe we'd see a huge spike in oil short term, uh, probably would, but I think with the production uh, continuing in the United States and in Canada, I, I think ultimately we can make up that shortfall. Ken Curtis, do you agree, or could this be a real concern? Well, it is. It is a concern. If there was a a, a real hot war in the Gulf, uh, if the troubles we saw last week in Nigeria were were to continue and and broaden in the country, obviously that would create more trouble. But my 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 reading of this, Tiki, is that uh, America, the American public, is very war weary. The American administration certainly doesn't want a war before the elections, I believe. And I think the U.S. military is pretty war-weary. So I think we'll see a lot of hot rhetoric, uh, maybe even increased uh, pressure. Uh, but I don't think it's going to come to a hot war over the next uh, over the next few months. And, and therefore, that's going to be good to keep oil prices probably this level or a little lower. So many issues in the pot. Ken Curtis there in Hong Kong, thank you so much for joining us. And Bob Bauer in our Sydney studio. Thank you thank very you. much.